fires one towards the goal. That's going to be clubbed by Travis Ridgen. Well, this is more like it. This is Slang in the Biscuit. Here's Travis Ridgen and Dave Wheeler. You know what? I would love to golf. I'd love to go golf at uh, the Banff Springs Golf Course. That looks like an unreal place to play right in the heart of the mountains. Dude, you should be happy at any course that would allow you to play. <laughs> are we going already? Are we Are we in? Are we talking Masters? Are we? It's Sunday. It's Sunday Masters. I'm going to listen. As soon as we're done this, I'm glued to my TV for the rest of the day. Period. Like, like you have no idea how special the Masters is to me. To me, this is my this is my mecca. This this is my this is my everything. This is the only golf tournament in the entire year where they play it on the exact same course. I know every hole. I know every inch. I know every blade of grass. I know every golfer. I I sign up. I I if they ask me for more money, I pay it. The Masters to me is life. I live. My only goal in life is to live until the next year's Masters. I think Dave loves golf. <laughs> oh, it's not just golf. The Masters is beyond golf. The Masters is something that I wish more sports would adopt. I really do. It's the only tournament of the entire year where it's played on the exact same course every year. The three other majors are played on different courses, and most of them are played on uh, McKenzie or very famous golf architect courses. But... The Masters is a Bobby Jones design and it's played there every year. It is church when it comes to golf. And once you win, you're invited back for life. I love that. You don't get a trophy. You don't, The money is one thing. You get a jacket. You get a jacket. I mean, homeless people would be happy to get a jacket. Golfers are excited to get a jacket. It's something special. It really, really is. And I hold it very near and dear to my heart, not only as a golfer, but as a sports fan, as a gaming fan, period. I don't want to open up a shit talking fest for the next 10 minutes, but if I was better at golf, I would do it more often. I really would. I, I enjoy it, but when I suck, it's not so enjoyable. I, I, I've told you this before. You don't have to be good at something in order to enjoy it. I'm not good at golf. I'll be honest with you. If I had to go out right now, I would probably play to about a 14 handicap, and that's being gracious because I haven't played since pre-pandemic. Avidly. I'd probably play, and that's just a little bit better than a bogey on every hole. A little bit better. But I love, I don't care if I triple bogey, if I double bogey, if I par, if I birdie. I love every second of being out there. I love the company. If I don't hit a good shot, I'm not going to be sitting there in the woods going, no, 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 I got to make sure I ran. I'll pull my ball out and I will enjoy the day and I'll just make sure I don't mark that down a score on that card. If I'm out with my family, I enjoy it. If I'm up with my friends, I enjoy it. If I'm competing for five bucks for a round or five bucks a hole, I enjoy it. I enjoy every aspect of the game. It is one of the greatest gifts we've ever had from Scotland, period. That's the difference between you and I, though. Like, when I step on the course, I'm coming to annihilate you. I'm going to destroy the competition. I'm going to win. And when I don't, that's when we start the hacking and the smacking and the whacking in the beach for six hours. Right. So, exactly. So, don't treat golf like you do hockey. They're two different things. I mean, when you're walking down the street and you're walking across the street, you're not jumping out ahead when it says don't walk. You're, you're, you're going when it says walk. And you're not trying to beat the other people across the street. You're just doing your thing. When you go out in the park, when you're walking the dog, you're not competing against other dog owners. When you're out with your girlfriend, you're not competing against other couples. You're out there to enjoy it for what it is. And it is a beautiful game. Mark Twain said it best. Golf is a good walk ruined. You don't have to compete in order to enjoy it. It is a great walk. It is a great excuse to walk. It is a very expensive habit. And believe me when I tell you, I've spent more money than I'd like to admit on golf. But I absolutely adore and I encourage everybody, regardless of your age, of your gender, of your mental capacity, get out and swing a club. It'll be the best challenge and the most rewarding challenge you have ever had in your life because the only person you're competing against is yourself my mom fully embodies that though i told you this before my mom is maybe the worst golfer i've ever seen probably worse than me but she loves it so much she's so happy to get out there hit the ball you know maybe it takes her five ten times whatever she's just happy to have a good time and be out there in the elements then you know what take a page out of your mom's book just enjoy it 
Just enjoy. You're not going to beat the course record. You're not. You're not going to beat. I'll be honest with you. I've seen you golf. I've watched you golf on video with Muzz. We all have. You're not a great golfer. You're not. And that's okay. Neither am I. Neither. I, I would love to start a YouTube channel where people just watch me golf. No one's going to watch it. I've actually watched people who are worse than me who get three times the views that we get on this YouTube channel. People just love watching golf. It's just a very... People say, oh, I love watching golf because I love to nap on Sundays. I'll just throw it on. It's just, it's very Bob Ross. It's just something in the background to watch. Great. If that's what it is for you, awesome. I had a period, of, a time in my life where I had a quarter acre in my backyard and I shaved really tight holes, uh, circles, I should say, in one end and one on the other. And I would just chip back and forth and my kids would come out and play. And that was awesome. We were outside. We were doing something. We were laughing. We were joking. I don't care if we hit the neighbor's house. It was just, it's, so, no, I'm dead serious. It's awesome. You it's said that until it was right. a broken thousand dollar window you had to fix. Ah, <laughs> the people I lived with were rich. I wasn't, but they were. Uh, Dude, quick, quick side note for a second. You're giving me deja vu to when I was a kid. When I was like eight, nine, ten years old, my dad and I would hit the baseball in the backyard. And I wasn't very good at baseball either. And I'd hit balls. And I remember one time specifically, it went right through the neighbor's window. And the neighbor came out and was like, you're going to pay to fix that. My dad's like, no, you will. <laughs> yeah, right. That's why you have insurance. That's why, yeah, yeah, bingo. Listen, uh, I I encourage everyone and anyone. There's actually a guy, uh, I'm going to say his first name wrong, so I won't even bother, but uh, Badia. He's an American, but first generation, uh, I believe, Indian descent. And he was part of the uh, Drive, Chip, and Putt, which is a uh, program no different than any other uh, sports program where uh, you come up, you're a junior, we'll invite you to these things, and it's just, just an encouragement to continue with the game. And he worked his way up, and he worked his way up, and he worked his way up, and he won a tournament. Now he's in the actual Masters. Like, he was part of that junior program that worked their way up, and he's playing this weekend. And he's actually, uh, we recorded it before the cut happened, but uh, based on the way he played uh, based on Thursday, he's going to make the cut. And to me, that's just, it. it, it I'll give you a perfect example. I was a member at a uh, an amazing golf club called uh, Elmhurst uh, once upon a time, and we had a bunch of retired uh, police officers who were members there, and I and I would golf with a handful of them. And it, this was at a time where both my kids were young, and uh, they both said, y "When when we were working, do you know how many calls we had to go to for kids making trouble on on a golf course? Zero. Putting your kids in golf is just." It teaches them manners. It teaches them structure. It teaches them patience. It teaches them so many things. And it is such a great thing to do later in life, throughout your entire life. You can play it from cradle to grave. Like, it's just, to me, and I know this is a hockey podcast, but hockey and golf have a very close relationship. I would encourage anybody. I, I don't care how old you are. I don't care where you are in life. Pick up a club. Take a lesson. You will enjoy it more than you ever thought you would, even if you hate the game. Try it. Please try it. Can we add that to our list of things to do? This summer, you and I got to hit the course. We got to stroke it for six to nine, to, or sorry, nine to 18 holes. And then we also got to hop and roll in the dojo for some uh, jiu-jitsu. Speaking of which, how did it go with uh, uh, your last uh, round there? Have you fought uh, Diamond Hands yet? No. <laughs> Diamond has laughed at me the other day when I was telling him about, hey, I, I think we should spar. Ha! He laughed at you. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, welcome back to the to the show. Welcome back to Sling the Biscuit. This is episode 14 of season four. My name is Travis Ridgen. That's Dave Wheeler. He's the better looking of the two. Young, ripped, and chiseled, 26 years old. Sorry, 27, wow. right, Dave? Well, sure. Yeah, we'll go with that. Listen, I'm a very proud 44 year old. <laughs> Cat's out of the bag now. Listen, listen, listen. I have earned every single one of these gray hairs. <laughs> you know, have you ever, I've always been interested by that. For women, when they go gray, it's it's the end of the world. Like, oh my God. But men go gray. That's sexy. A little salt and pepper. You know what I mean? I got, I got, I don't know if you ever noticed in the video version. This is the first time I'll talk about it. I got this little like white stripe in my hair. You always have though. I know. It just popped up. It popped up when I was 19. It's like, boom. It's like a little strand of white hair. My hairdresser says he charges people 200 bucks to like color that. I'm like, bro, I'll pay 200 bucks to get rid of it. But anyway. You know what? Here's the, here's the messed up part. If you're anything like Jay Leno, when you eventually go full gray, that exact spot that you're talking about will go back to brown or black. 
Just gonna dye your hair. Uh, I've dyed the beard once. I didn't like it. I'm okay with it. I earned these. These these are like trophies, individual trophies. I'm uh, I after shaving my head for the uh, the cancer that we talked about uh, last month. Um, my my hair is now coming back a little more gray, and I'll I'll show you if you want. But it's it's coming back a little more gray. Just like for the record, for anybody that doesn't know, Dave didn't shave his head because he has cancer. It was for cancer, right? Yeah, no, no, no. It was in support of a, a friend, and I donated my hair for those that are new to the podcast. I donated my hair to uh, kids uh, for wigs uh, that are going through chemotherapy, and I was happy to do it. But it was like my hair was like long, long. Uh, but it's uh, and and I knew it. I even said to my wife, I said it's gonna come in more gray once I cut it off. She goes, "That's okay, that's okay." And keep in mind, my wife is a uh, beautiful ginger from birth and the thing about gingers is they don't go gray they go straight white like they go from from ginger to strawberry blonde to white pure white like gandalf white i never dated a ginger i don't think ever yeah don't (laughs) they have no souls (laughs) (laughs) the uh the automatic doors at safeway do not open for her (laughs) so what do you do then do you open the door for her I have to, have to. I always go first. She's like, "You go ahead." <laughs> you, you're sorry. You're giving me deja vu. I got, I got a little bit of the doghouse for this one. The last girl that I was dating, I remember we went to this one place. It said no pets allowed. We went to the front door. I said, oh, "Sorry, sweetheart, you gotta wait outside." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> reminds me of uh, back in the '70s. Uh, anyone who is from the former Czechos- uh, Czechoslovakia, which is now the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Uh, but back in the day, uh, when people would still accept checks at restaurants and, and businesses and whatnot, uh, some some would not because they would bounce and it would say no checks allowed. And my dad worked with a bunch of check guys. He'd be like, "Oh, sorry, you're not allowed in." <laughs> I love dad humor. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, listen, uh, before we get into anything really pressing, is there any sponsor that you want to do? Because I'm going to go on a bit of a diatribe here, and I really want to press on this. So. Uh, let, let's get a sponsor out of the way because I'm going to go long on this one. Sense Arena. Sense Arena is bringing the podcast to you today for the second week in a row. The Sense Arena is a virtual reality training tool. It is changing the way that guys and gals train from over 100 plus drills, training tools that are made by pro coaches and players. Sense Arena VR, NHL Sense Arena VR has it all. And right now, when you go to the link in the video description, you click on that at NHLSenseArena.com, use the code BISCUIT. B-I-Z-K-I-T. It's going to get you access to 50 bucks off your annual plan. I've been using Sense Arena for well over a year. It's incredible. So let's say you're in rural Saskatchewan, you don't have access to ice, or maybe you're in downtown Toronto, you can't afford $500 an hour for ice. You're recovering from hip surgery, ankle surgery, knee surgery, whatever it may be. It gives you options to keep those reps, to work on that game sense, to work on getting your mind frame, your framework right if you can't get on the ice. So Sense Arena is awesome. Sense Arena is bringing the podcast to you. And thank you to them for being the presenting sponsor for today's show. Dave, let's talk some Jets and Coyotes, or Jets, sorry, Coyotes to Utah. Okay, let's go back to the late 90s. Keep in mind, I was living in northern Alberta at this time, but my heart absolutely broke when I watched the Jets leave to Arizona, Phoenix. Absolutely broke. It was one less Canadian team. And keep in mind, I was one of those kids that uh, kept all their hockey cards in a large stack with elastics around it, and I, I... alphabetized them, so W, Winnipeg, was at the bottom. So it was, you know, everything in the middle got lost. So I was always at the top, at the bottom, checking through, going through, adding, you know, whatnot, hockey card kid. Uh, Eventually got to shoeboxes where I would organize them. But uh, the Winnipeg Jets, and growing up in northern Alberta, uh, was an Oiler fan growing up, and so always uh, saw the Jets in the first round of the playoffs, and they were just... They were, they were a staple. They were an absolute staple. It's like, all right, we're going to see the Jets in the first round. So as much as I didn't cheer for the Jets when I was a kid because I was an Oiler fan, the Jets were just a thing. And when I became a teenager, I was graduating high school, and they left. And I didn't really understand it properly until I moved to Winnipeg. And I moved to Winnipeg in 2003, so a good five, six years after the Jets left. And we had the Manitoba Moose. And I worked with the Manitoba Moose. I, I went to the old Winnipeg Arena before uh, what is now Canada Life Center uh, was built in downtown Winnipeg in the old uh, footprint of the Bay Building um, or the Sears Building. Eaton Center, Sears? no? Eaton Center, yes, thank you. So 
I, I, I was there for the aftermath, and I was there for the for 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 the heartbreak and the save our jets, bring our jets back, and the Manitoba Mamus, who were the absolute crown jewel of the American Hockey League. Uh, I was the uh, in-house announcer for the Manitoba Moose. And every time there was a league meeting, it was like, all right, let's see what the Moose are doing because they're they're going to set the trend and we're just going to follow whatever they do. And when they came back, I was here for that. And that's when I really got it because I was a, I was a big proponent of, hey, listen, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. You've got the American Hockey League. You've got a competitive team. You've got a great team. It's well-supported. we got... 8,800 people a night. We're selling it every night. You know, maybe we're not big enough. And I and I, I was a big one to say, you know what? Maybe we don't need the NHL. But when I came back, that's when I really got it. And I understood. Now, I'm saying all that because Gary Bettman, the first big move that he made as commissioner of the National Hockey League was to move the Jets out of Winnipeg down to Phoenix. And it was a bold move. Now, keep in mind... Gary Bettman was not hired by the fans. He was hired by the owners. And he's been doing that gig for 30-plus years. And if he was doing a bad job, he may not be doing a great job for the fans, but if he was doing a bad job for the owners, he would have been canned by now. He's doing a great job. Owners are making money. But now we're in a situation where the Coyotes have been bleeding money. Bleeding money to the point where nobody wants to take them on as tenants They've been playing at the Mullet Arena, which is ASU, uh, Arizona State University, the hockey team there. They've been playing there for a couple of years. 4,500 seat capacity. The Jets had a hard time getting an NHL team because we were 15-5, and that's bare minimum. Bare minimum. As far Just as for a little attendance. bit of contrast, yours truly who's played in the FPHL, practice in the FPHL, whatever you want to call it. I've played in arenas bigger than the Coyotes Arena, just for some context. Right. Exactly. Especially when you go to bingo. Right? Yeah, you, Binghamton, you, Mississippi, we had almost 10,000 seats. So the Coyotes are doing 4,500, just for a little bit of context there. Great example. So they've been playing out of the Mullet Arena. Now, the idea was, is that, hey, listen, we're going to make a pitch for a plot of land. We're going to build a billion-dollar arena, compound, apartments, uh, condos, shopping, entertainment, just in North Phoenix, right on the edge of Scottsdale, uh, it's going to be great, but it's about three years away. So we want to keep playing at Mullet Arena until then. And now the idea is, is like, no, the owners are not down with that. They're not down for the next three years of supporting this fledgling team. So the idea is, is within this week, when this podcast drops, within the next five days, when the season ends, they're going to announce the Phoenix, the Arizona Coyotes, are going to be moving to Utah, Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah, where the Utah Jazz and the NBA play, sharing an arena with them. And th- here's the messed up part. I'm, I'm I'm kind of okay with that. I get it. I think there are more, more deserving cities. Quebec City, number one. Kansas City, number two. Even Saskatoon. Even Regina. And you know how I feel about Regina. There you don't are like more. Them. There are more deserving cities to get it. Even Hamilton, there are St. John's, Moncton, there are more deserving cities that could support a hockey team, and they want to put it in a unproven city. I'm okay with it because they've proven that the desert does not want hockey. But here's the messed up part. They want to move it to Utah where it will stay, and then in three years when they build that billion-dollar arena, Phoenix will get an expansion team back. That I don't get. That's the part that baffles me. We've proved. There's rumors that they're going to go back to Atlanta for the third time. Why are we trying to force hockey into markets that don't want it? It doesn't make sense to me. There are cities that are begging for it. And they won't give them to them. That, that's the part of the league. And I understand they do not have a red cross above their door. I understand. Gary Bettman is there to make the money. Phoenix obviously proved they cannot make money. They can't. They're bleeding money. So why would you want to put a team back there? It's the third largest market in North America. I get it, but why? I have the perfect analogy for you, Dave. You ready? Please. Now, I, Travis Ridgen, may know a thing or two about stopping pucks, but you know what I know a lot about? Relationships and dating. And I'm going to give you the perfect analogy. It's like when you break up with a chick 
and then you revisit it at a later moment in time. It's the equivalent of you bring the trash out to the curb, you leave it there, you go back inside, then you go back to pick through the trash, and now you're first off, you're a trash picker. Your neighbor's going to see you picking through the trash, and it's never really worth what you thought it was in the beginning. So take the Coyotes, leave them in Utah, or bring them back to Winnipeg, two teams, go Jets, go. No, no. Listen, we got the uh, we got we got the Jets. We got the Manitoba Moose, who are still fairly well supported. I would like to see more bums in the seats for the Moose, uh, and, and and I'm I'm guilty. I even said, you know what? Even though the Jets are back, I'm still going to support the Moose. I have been to I I can use one hand for the amount of games that I've been to for the Manitoba Moose since the Jets have been back, and I'm embarrassed by that. Uh, but I still I I report on their scores. Uh, every morning, uh, whenever I can, on my, on my radio show on Energy One Hundred Six, uh, and I I I think if you put a team in Hamilton, the Buffalo Sabers would cease to exist because you got a lot of people traveling over that border. The majority of the Buffalo Sabers fans are Hamilton people. Um, I think there are more deserving cities than Utah. I really do, and I can think of a handful of them. I'll be honest with you. I didn't think Vegas would work, but it works because they have a competitive team. I knew Seattle would work. I I did, but I think there are other teams that are more deserving, or other cities that are more deserving than Utah. You know what's interesting? Some of the teams that, like at least like the last team that I played for, like with us having like 9,000, almost 10,000 seats, you, in theory, would have a bigger market there for an NHL team than there was for that league. What do you mean? So, like, when I, I was playing for the Seawolves, right, like, we had a capacity for nine, almost 10,000 people, and there would be nights where they would get close to seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 seats, like 9,000 people in the seats, compared to the Coyotes, where when they had a full capacity arena, they're struggling to do five or six. You see what I'm saying? So if you take those fans, put them in an NHL arena, you get more fans in that small town of, I don't know how many thousands of people compared to how many millions in Phoenix or any of the other markets that they've tried, like Atlanta. Well, that was the idea, even with Mullet Arena, which is uh, the ASU, is Arizona State University rink. You know who the um, real loser in all this is? Who? The chicks at ASU. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're really or, losing or, out here. Or, or the ASU uh, male players who are like, oh, we're getting outshone. We're getting outshone by the big league. Um, the idea was is like, hey, it's 4,500. We'll be packed every night. And they even have a hard time packing 4,500. They really do. And that's sad. There's a saying that I had for many, many months. It was, we're going early. We're going often. Early and often. Boney's off. Ice is ready, fellas. They take that to a whole new definition. We're moving early and often. Moving to Utah and often back to Arizona. Listen, I... I don't want to throw shade at Utah. I mean, I, I they have the mountains. Uh, and it's going to shuffle the division a little bit, which I'm okay with. If the idea is to grow the league by two or three or four more teams, I'm okay with that. But you got to be a little more picky choosy. I mean, Utah, when you think about it on the surface, I mean, the, the idea they're throwing around is the uh, the Utah Yeti. Kind of similar to the Veil, vale, Veil vale Yeti. Great place. Yeah. Uh, and the logo they would use is actually the old uh, Winnipeg Ice, uh, which they was which is the Western Hockey League team here. That was the that was the going theory. They currently have the Utah Jazz in the NBA. Salt Lake City is rich. Like it's a very rich city. A lot of Mormons, a lot of money, not a lot of drinking. Uh, and, and please, if, if, if you're in the Salt Lake area, please let me know. Let me prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. I would love to see a lot of support because I've been looking online and we, on our radio show, we actually called down to Utah and people didn't have a clue. They're like, oh, what? Ho- hockey? What? But this, when I was down in Vegas before the Golden Knights got announced, I was down there just for a random weekend with a bunch of the boys, and I was in a cab, and I was like, hey, man, what about the NHL? He's like, oh, Golden Knights, it's happening. Yeah, 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 we're excited, man. T-Mobile Arena, can't wait. The fans were craving. They they were begging for it. I have not been to Salt Lake City. I've never been there. Would love to go down for a boys' trip down there, but I'm really curious. If you're in the Salt Lake area or if you know anything about the Utah area, please, down in the comments, let me know. Is there a thirst for hockey? Because I'm I'm really curious to know. You know what I would love to see? Is the Jets bring back the original Jets logo in uh, colors for the playoffs. Like the white and the blue and the red. 
Well, they have in uh, uh, alumni games, and we've done a, a version of it uh, for the retro jerseys. I mean, every NHL team has like 10 jerseys now for, for merchandising. Merchandising, merchandising. Money Reminds grab. Of, uh, Spaceballs. Yeah, no, it's true. And I don't blame them. I get it. But one thing about Mark Chipman, and I know him personally, uh, he is the uh, board member for the uh, for the Winnipeg Jets. He did not want the Jets. He that was the last thing he wanted when he got the team. When he when he bought Atlanta, it was actually Gary Bettman that talked to him saying, "Dude, nostalgia, go with it." And he's like, "Fine, but no logo." And Gabe Bettman is like, "Retro, retro logo." So they have used the old Jets retro logo, but not to the ones that you would see with Dale Howarchuk back in the uh, back in the eighties. Yeah, they use like the WHA, that. like the dark blue, dark red, and white jet stuff. Like the the 91 through 96. Those are the sickest jerseys, the sickest Jays of all time. Like the Solani Last days. winners of the Avco Cup, baby. We own it. No one will ever get that cup again. The Avco Cup, Winnipeg Jets. Last winners. Always will be. Never will be undone. Boom. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Woo! Crocodile shoe wearing, jet flying, whatever you say. And I'm having a hard time holding these alligators down. There it is. Uh, can I give a quick shout out? Uh, the other day I was walking across the street in downtown Vancouver and um, there's a lot of homeless people in the area. And I got honked at by a bus driver and I thought, was it the homeless guy or was that me? Bus driver unrolls the window and says, hey, come here. And I walk over and the guy smiles at me and he says, what time is it in Danbury? And I said, 12 past Ridgen, bud. <laughs> And uh, the bus driver's name is Steve, Steve Jacob. Shout out to Steve. He's been watching the show for a long time. And he just said, thank you very much for doing the show. Hi, Dave. By the way, hi, Wheeler. And uh, you guys' show makes my day, makes my week. Please don't stop doing it. So, Steve, shout out to you. Keep the great work with the BC Vancouver, BC Transit Association. You should have let him hit you with the bus because at least you could have said, hey, I've stopped the bus. (laughs) Ah, shit, it went through my legs. Damn it. For the record, uh, I, since we're doing shout outs, I would like to send a shout out to uh, uh, Rick, uh, aka Ross the Boss uh, from Calgary. He's kind of Calgary, uh, Colorado, Alberta, Colorado, uh, oil guy. Uh, him and his son Connor flew all the way in from Calgary uh, to see the Jets and Flames, uh, which we went to the game, went to the King's Head Pub, one of the best spots in Winnipeg in the exchange, uh, went to the game. Uh, Connor, who is 10 years old, Big Flames fan, unfortunately had to watch his Flames lose, uh, but an absolute beauty. Uh, We had a great time, flew in, flew out. It was his first time. He actually left Manitoba before the Jets came back, so it was his first Jets game. But because he raised his son in in the Calgary area, uh, his son became a, a Flames fan, so God love him. He got to see what it was like seeing a Jets game in person for the first time. Uh, so big, big shout out to Rick, who is a big supporter of this show. Uh, he's a Patreon member, uh, his son, Connor, Connor, you did a great job. He was hanging out with my boys. My wife came out. We had a great time with the Jets game. Uh, Jets won five, two, and that was the game that the Jets clinched an official playoff spot. So yeah, it was a great time. He, he officially went back to uh, Colorado, Calgary area. And what a great time. What a great time. It's weird because I had been to. Canada Life Center so many times. It was it was his first time seeing a Jets game, and I had to keep reminding myself, going, "Oh yeah, th- this is your first time. This is this is like church for you. This is like the Masters for you," because he was such he was a uh, a distant Jets fan. So it was it was fun to witness that from a third person experience. A shout out to the Patreon members too. For five bucks a month right now, you join, get all the episodes, all the deleted episodes, the untold stories of the FPHL. Also. Uh, early access episodes, so YouTube has the ability now if you're a channel member or a Patreon member. So we record usually like on Thursdays-ish or Fridays, so the episodes go up a day or two beforehand. And then the general public gets them on Sundays. Five bucks gets you my trading cards. Uh, the seven-piece set were sold out of the original Varberg card. But, to, oh, by the way, my graphic designer is doing up uh, a Vale, a Watertown, and a Mississippi card. So those will be holographic cards added to the set very soon. If you're a Patreon member, you get those for free. And thank you for supporting the show and making it possible. Do I get a card? What would the back of your hockey cards say? Tried really hard. <laughs> you know, that's the worst. If you are if you ever play hockey and people ask, oh, what was Ridgen like? Great guy, tries hard, good room guy, great glue guy, great for the environment, great for the morale. And uh, yeah, he was just a great teammate. That means you sucked. <laughs> Listen, stop talking about the guy that I do a podcast with that way. I think he is a great goalie. 
I think he is. A, 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 he can stop a lot of pucks, not all of them, but no, no goaltender can. Well, of course, if I stopped all the pucks, I'd be in the NHL and I wouldn't be doing the show with you. I'd say, see you later, Dave. Listen, if that was the case, if you said, hey, listen, I'm on my way to this show. We can't do the podcast anymore. Good riddance. Hey, you know what I saw a comment the other day? It was a comment that was, hey, we should kick Trav off the show and get Rob and Dave to do a show. If I go, if I can get a deal like that, you can have that wish. Listen, can we can we get Rob on for an episode? I've been trying to get him to come down to Winnipeg. I, I got to keep greasing. Everybody send Rob a message at rob.lala on Instagram. Send him a message. Come to Winnipeg. Let's go this summer. We can go golfing too. We can roll in the jiu-jitsu studio too. For the record, can we talk about that really quickly? The Muay Thai or the jiu-jitsu? Either or. Sure. Go ahead. What do you got? Well, I just wanted to say it was probably about a month and a half ago. I gave you a little bit of advice because I because you were running some B-roll on the YouTube version. By the way, if you're listening on the audio version, thank you very much. Appreciate it. If you have the capacity, go check out the uh, the YouTube version because there's a little more context to what we talk about. There's a little more video. And one of the ones was I was commenting on some of your B-roll of you in the Muay Thai studio and the kickboxing studio. And I had a few pointers for you. And did it work out for you? Worked out good. It worked out really good. I got that length. I got the reach. I got long arms, long legs. And you know what's interesting? In the past, like, four or five weeks, I've been going a lot to uh, Muay Thai. And some of the guys at the beginning were smoking me. I'm just soaking punches in the face, left, right, and center, and just hoping, oh, shit, I got, got another minute and a half in here, and then I'll, I can go home. To now where, like, one of the guys that was dominating me said to me that after uh, yesterday's class, man, you're giving me a hard time now. You're using your reach. You're using your kicks. And... It, uh, it feels good. And I'm just sitting in the pocket. I'm soaking. I'm getting better every single day. Every single time I go to Muay Thai. I love it. Did you uh, did you switch up to Southpaw? A little bit. I was mixing back and forth. We're trying to get my uh, yeah. my strong hand, my right hand, leading forward with the jab and trying to mix yeah. a, couple, a couple of different combinations. The kick, the kick combos were good, especially because I got the reach. So I get guys backing up towards the fence. And then when I get them in the clinch, well, I get to go to work with those long knees. It really helps. It really helps. Nice. Good advice, Dave. Dave, if you're listening to the show for the first time, Dave Wheeler is a very, very smart man. He may be one of the most hated men in Winnipeg, but next to me, but he's a very smart man. Listen, it comes with experience. It comes, wisdom does not come in a book. Wisdom comes with experience. And I, I'm i not even going to say I'm done. I'm going to get way smarter as I go along. I really am, and I'm okay with that. And the day you stop learning is the day you die. I, I pray that I learn more as I go along. I pray that I learn more. As I go along, I'm 44 years in. When I see people writing books in their 20s, I go, no, you're not ready. You got to be at least for you to write a book. I'm, I'm approaching 45 this year, and I'm just starting to put pen to paper. And even then, I'm kind of like, ah, I don't know. I don't know if I have enough, enough experience to put pen to paper and tell people. Wisdom comes with experience, period. I actually bought my first book for the first time ever last week. I don't know if I told you that or not. What'd you buy? I bought an audio book because I thought about getting the paper version. I was like, ah, I don't want to read. I want to have it read to me. So I got a uh, I got a free one-month trial of Audible. I downloaded a book called The Unplugged Alpha by Rich Cooper. It's about a six-hour listen, and he just reads it to you. It's great. Uh, the last book I read cover to cover uh, was Dave Grohl's book. And I'm a big Dave Grohl fan. You know that. He's the... Uh, former drummer for Nirvana, one of your favorite bands, uh, lead singer and songwriter for the Foo Fighters and played in a bunch of different bands. He actually played on the uh, studio version of Songs for the Deaf by Queens of the Stone Age, who I went and saw this past Friday with my dear friend Christian Marner, uh, who he and I have traveled great distances to see this band. Uh, Josh Homme is a lead singer. Uh, they are a unsung hero in the rock world. And... They have been doing this for close to 30 years now. And believe me when I tell you, they have got it down to a science. They were tight. They were concise. They were perfect. They played everything I wanted to hear and left out the songs that I really wanted to hear. And in the vein of always leave the audience wanting more, I got everything I wanted, but I still wanted more. They played at Canada Life Center. We had good seats. They were fantastic. But none of the big, you know, in the Eras Tour, you can go see Taylor Swift. I know we mentioned before, it's like, Videos everywhere and big screens everywhere. No videos. No video screens anywhere. Just them, some lights, and good old-fashioned rock and roll. And it was fantastic. So 
Dave Grohl played in that band in the early 2000s. And yeah, what a great show. Made me feel young again, sir. Ooh. Sorry, you're giving me deja vu. I had this one chick I dated for a while. She bought me this book for my birthday. It was the Kurt Cobain autobiography by Charles Cross, Heavier Than Hell. And then I read split, that. Great it was a great book. book. I read it cover to cover like 10 times. And then when we split, she took it. And then I have a text her, be like, hey, can I get that book back? Pfft, nothing. So Listen, did, did, did Charles Cross sign it? Then if he didn't sign it, there's you can go buy another one. I, I know, but it's the principle. I wanted the book back. Yeah, listen, you know how many copies of Pearl Jam 10 I've lost on CD dating women and hoodies and yeah, listen, you when it comes to a breakup when it and not a marriage, you deal. You just deal. Can I get my book back? Now I think about it. It's kind of funny. The only the only thing you're lucky to to not get is a is a lower decker. <laughs> you see that comment last week? You sent me a screenshot of it, and I loved it. So for those that missed the episode, long story short, I before I met my wife, I uh, had I exacted a little bit of revenge on a uh, toxic ex who uh, who broke my heart, and I laid Single an mommy. upper decker. I laid an upper decker in the upper deck of her toilet, and someone said, "You ever laid a lower decker?" And the screenshot you sent me was, "You don't lay it up top. You lay it down in the uh, in the floor grates of the HVAC system." Pull off the uh, little, yeah, down there, yeah. Never even crossed my mind, but now I think it's hilarious. That's disgusting. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Somebody also left a comment. Um, the clip from my tour, sorry, I'm crying again. The Upper Decker story is just as good the first time as it is the 17th time. Um, we had a clip a couple weeks ago where Dave was talking about the greatest trip ever when he told Ref, hey, can I get a penalty for thinking? No. Well, why? Well, I think you suck. So that clip did about two, two and a half million views on Instagram, which is crazy. It was the highest view clip we've ever done for the show. And somebody sent me a message and said, that's great. But the best trip I've ever heard is some vet went down to a rookie who was wearing like the bubble. Like, you, know, you know what I mean? Like the bubble, like the visor, like the full cage, right? And he says, hey, bud, can I get fries with that? That's <laughs> <laughs> pretty good one. I've, I've heard a similar one going, Does that thing have power windows? Um, by the way, shout out to the person. And actually, it, it, it validates uh, the story I told. Phil Marr, a real human being, he's like, yo, that's a real referee. I've actually had him referee my games. Real human being, real story. It happened. Uh, on the topic of real stories, though. So, sorry, I'm still crying from the, the upper deck, the upper and the lower deckers. We're thinking about, we're thinking about those Listen, for a do, while. Do me a favor. Don't break up just for the sake of doing that. <laughs> I'm just going to go on a revenge tour so I can start telling stories about leaving upper and lower deckers in honor of David favor, Wheeler. Do me a favor. Go get a shutout instead. I'm working on it. I'm going to Spain this yeah, season. I know you I are. You heard. I know you are. Yeah. I, by the way, I uh, can't wait. Can we touch on that real quick? Uh, let's do a quick sponsor mention, and then I, I want to talk a little bit about Spain. Yeah, so when I go to Spain, the mamacitas are going to be really excited. And if I'm going to see the mamacitas, I'm going to make sure I'm all taken care of and groomed and manscaped. Manscaped.com. They have the Beard Hedger, which is awesome. I've been using that in my beard for almost a year and a half now. Fade and taper, 20 different lengths, 60 minutes of battery life. It's water resistant as well. It's awesome. And then the lawnmower for all your below the belt grooming. Take care of it on date night. Your shrub, your trees, all of it. You go to Manscaped.com. The code Biscuit, B-I-Z-K-I-T, will get you 20% off and free shipping only from the team of Manscaped. Back to Spain. You want to talk a little, uh, little Spain? Yeah, so listen, Spain... So the idea is is you're reporting in mid-October. So in between, uh, as far as this podcast and your training schedule, I'm curious to know how we're going to navigate this because obviously we can cover a bit of the of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Uh, I'm going to be all over the Jets, obviously. But I really want to know, uh, and again, down in the comments, let us know, what do you want to see? I mean, summer is kind of uh, lame for hockey talk. Things aren't going to start ramping up until, I mean, I know the European leagues kind of start up in, in September, NHL in October. Uh, you're going to be reporting. Season doesn't really start in Spain until late October, early November. So uh, do you want to kind of tell them what we're planning on doing for the summer? Yes, yeah, so we got a couple different plans for the podcast and for the vlog as well. So like Dave mentioned, let us know in the comment section. Is there anything you want us to talk about specifically? Because that does help because this is a viewer-powered show. Without the viewers, the show is nothing. But as far as the vlog and the podcast goes, so the vlog is going to be going quiet for the next little bit. A couple uploads here and there, but the vlog is also going to carry a lot of the behind-the-scenes stuff. So, for example, 
when I go to Toronto at the end of June, beginning of July, I just booked a trip to go see my boy Muzz, uh, Matt Murray, Muskoka. We're going to be doing a little bit of golfing and then recording a show as well as some other interviews I'm going to be working on. Those are going to go with some behind the scenes video for the vlog and also start to roll out in August ish. And they're going to piggyback off one another because from now until July has always been graveyard season as far as like hockey content. I hate the word content, but now until July has always been quiet. So no sense kind of pushing it. We're going to save it and give you the best of the best. By the way, Nick the goalie and I recorded the pros versus Joe's video the other day. It's hilarious. It's going to be awesome come probably August, September ish to get that out there. You're really going to love that. But, you know, actually, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. I, I know Dave and I haven't really talked about this, but you know you know who one person I'd really love to get on the podcast is? Kazmir Kaskasuo, goalie right now for in the American League for the Laval Rocket, played over in Sweden. Pat Shea and I had him on the show a couple years ago when we were first starting. I have a lot of questions about him, about content creating, about goaltending, just about being a man. I don't know if his wife would let him come on the show, but I'd be very curious if he did come on the show the kind of conversation we would have because I have lots of questions. He's by far the most requested interview I get all the time. Like, get Kaz on the show, get Kaz on the show. Hey, Kaz, if you want to come on the show, you're more than welcome to, and I'd love to share a conversation with you, my friend. But Kaz, Matt Murray, uh, we're working on getting Trevor Kidd as well, getting a bunch of interviews. I know uh, Dave just made a call to Corey Schneider like five minutes before we started recording to try to get Schneids on. So those are all going to start rolling out over the summer, as well as in tandem with the vlog. And then a side thing is the uh, Grand Railway Hotel series that I've kind of talked about with all the railway hotels across Canada. That will roll yeah. out probably in July-ish on my main channel. So that is the plan for the next couple months. And then after that, it's on to Spain and on to the next season, the next chapter in my pro hockey career, playing for the Mamacitas, where they call me Big Papi, the King of Spain. I'll be honest with you, in, in, in my life, uh, I've always said the greatest measuring stick for time you can have is having children. And as much as I want things to start slowing down a lot because my kids are growing up very quickly, I've got one in cadets, one in archery, one's turning 13, one's turning 10. Um, I don't want time to go by quickly, but I am so excited for you to go to Spain that I want time to speed up and for you to get there so we can start talking about it. Like, I'm, I'm really excited, man. Like, I really am. You know, it's, it's so interesting because... Myself personally, I have lots of questions, right? Like I haven't been to Spain ever. I know a little bit about my team and my new management just based on what my agent tells me. But outside of that, my limit is my knowledge is very limited, kind of like the viewers of the show, to just you know playing Google, Dr. Google and what you can find. So I've gotten a lot of messages about what is the level like, what is the team like, what's the room like, what's the country like, what's the town like, what's the weather like. The answer, I don't know, but I'm gonna find out with you and I'm gonna share it with you in video format in the vlog and then all the more detailed stuff in the podcast. And I'm really excited. You know, the last two years in ish. And change my love for hockey is kind of tapered off just a little bit with the business side of things but europe sweden and norway is where i really found my love for hockey and i'm excited to refine that to rejuvenate that and to start a new chapter in my career in spain and yeah i'm excited for great weather great hockey great times and a great team with the uh the team of millennia the uh, panthers with the uh, orange and black colors by the way i'm gonna get my mask repainted this summer orange and black but the rest will just be like all white gear i think for next season. You're not uh, you're not punching a clock every single day, so uh, you know be happy about that. I'd be lying if I said there wasn't moments over the past two years where it felt like that. There's there's really good moments, but there's also moments where it felt like oh, this is this is a bit of a challenge. But like we've talked about, adversity builds character, and that's good, right? Like your story sucks if it was just all blueberries and paper airplanes and peaches. You got to go through some adversity to tell a story, and to a degree, like. Personal branding, like my story through pro hockey, is like everybody else's, full of adversities, ups, downs. I'll take you with, take you with me along the ride, and I hope that you can take some inspiration from the story because I, I do love hockey and I love goaltending and I love doing this show. This show is literally for the last two years been my favorite thing I do every single week between Wheeler and I and sharing with the incredible viewers that watch it and listen to it. We prefer if you watched it, but you can listen to it as well on Apple and Spotify. I am eighty-five percent confident, and keep in mind, sixty-six percent uh, of stats are made up on the spot. I am eighty-five percent confident in saying that seventy-five percent of the people watching and listening to this podcast right now, including me, would trade spots with you in a heartbeat. Well, like you said, people work their entire lives to get two weeks to go to Spain, to go to France, to go to wherever. I get to do it. I don't get to pay for it. I get paid to do it. And I get to live my dream every single day. Like I've talked about on the vlog many times. My dream when I was 10 years old, my dad took me to school early, was to skate every day during weekdays, at least two days a week. At that time, I didn't know pro hockey was five days a week plus. I thought it was only two. But now the fact that I get to do it five plus, I live the dream every single day. This is the greatest job in the world, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. I really do love By it. By the way, quick shout out to my boy, uh, Dr. Crutt. And keep in mind, when I say Dr. Crutt, that's his nickname. But he actually is a doctor. He's a PhD in the realm of physics. 
And he uh, he and I like to go out and we drink and we debate and uh, we yell at each other and we we hug at the end. And so it's a very uh, it's a very challenging relationship and we both love it. We golf together a lot. And for the uh, solar eclipse that happened last week, he was so into this. And keep in mind, a lot of his business happens in Indianapolis. He travels down there on a regular basis and he's got three kids at home. So it's it's a challenge for him. But his job is in Indian, just outside of Indianapolis. And he flew all the way to Austin, Texas, just to see the solar eclipse. Just to see the solar eclipse, okay? Flew down, told me about it, texted me. He's like, ah, I'm getting to see it. You're going to see a partial eclipse. F you. Ha, ha, ha. Got down to Austin. All they saw was clouds. All they saw was clouds. And I texted him, like, how was it? He's like, clouds. I'm like, dude, <laughs> Indy, Indy's getting clear skies. He's like, I know. So regardless of how hard you try to get what you want, sometimes the option that you don't want is the better option. I know that's a really weird lesson. I know that you really got to like like focus hard on, on, on that, but take it from Dr. Crutt, a PhD, a guy that spent his life in science who had the opportunity to go down to a place, place that he's very familiar with and said, no, no, I'm going to go here instead and screwed it up. Even brilliant people can screw it up every once in a while. PhD, pimp and hose degree. He married three children, very proud of all of his children. Uh, Max, Penny, and Calvin. Speaking of kids, though, uh, I, I haven't mentioned this for the last couple of weeks for a reason, which I'll explain. But I'm going back to Winnipeg this Sunday. I'm going to go see Dave, do some in-person episodes. But more importantly, I've been planning a surprise trip back to Winnipeg for my mom. So I'm flying back on Sunday. It's her birthday coming up next week. She has no idea that I'm coming. She has no idea anything. Obviously, she'll find out when she listens to the show on Monday, as she always does. But by then, it'll be too late. And going back to Winnipeg. Hi, hi mom. I'm going to be taking my mom for a little bit of a staycation. I already got a massage book for her because my mom's really stressed. She's got shoulder surgery coming up. Uh, I got some reservations for a nice dinner plan for my mom as well. You don't know this, but I'm the one administering the massage. (laughs) (laughs) You creep. (laughs) Well, here's the best part, too, is that after all of this, if my mom does not finally admit that I'm her favorite child, I will be sending her an invoice for the full bill. But I'm very excited to see my mom. And, uh, yeah, I love my mom very much. Well, I'm excited to see you. We're going to bang out a bunch of episodes for this summer. Um, and I, I know you didn't give too much of a um, of a preview, but you and I are going to do, we're going to go the way of Mr. Beast. We're going to do a lot of reaction videos. I'm, I'm tired of watching these people overseas and in Great Britain and areas where they're reacting to hockey videos for the first time and having no idea what they're talking about. But you and I are actually going to react as two guys who have grown up with the sport and we're going to react to viral videos from past and present and 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 give our honest opinion on what we're seeing and I'm really excited for it. We're going to we're going to record a whole bunch of stuff in person, you and I same studio. Get excited for that cuz I am. Then if there's anything you want us to react to, leave in the comments section below. We'll put a montage together in this July. It will be a lot of reaction videos. So, I'm excited for that. I'm excited to do the show every single week like we always do leading up to that moment. But my name is Travis Ridgen. That's Dave Wheeler. This is Sling the Biscuit Podcast. We do new, new episodes every single Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern in downtown Toronto outside of the CN Tower, 10 a.m. in Winnipeg, Manitoba, home of the Prairies at the corner of the Red and the Cinnabon River meeting at the Forks, 9 a.m. in Saskatoon. They have a time change, right, Dave? Can we confirm that, please? They never change their time. Never change their time? Okay, well, I don't know what time it is in Saskatoon. It is 9 a.m., down the Bow Valley in Calgary, Alberta, in the foothills of, the, of Alberta, and then 8 a.m. here in the Pacific Northwest. I'm sorry, Saskatoon. Thank you for listening to the show. Dave, you, you don't have a guitar? You can't take us home? Unless you want it. If you want more guitar, comments down below. Just say, guitar. That's it. That's all you got to do. No, no, no. Comment more cowbell. So people reading the comment <laughs> section won't know what we're talking about until they watch the full length of the show. So it needs more cowbell. i got a fever. And the only what prescription... I'm- but for the record, that's my wife's father. Cowbell? Never mind. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>